Welcome to the Korea Pro Podcast. I'm your host, Chung Min Kim, the Editorial Director of Korea Pro. And I'm John Lee, the Editor of Korea Pro. Join us for a weekly 15-minute conversation as we dive into the most pressing stories shaping South Korea and dissect the most complicated ones for you. From politics to culture, technology to society, we've got you covered. So stay ahead of the curve and never be sidelined again. So get ready for a fresh perspective on South Korea's news. This is the Korea Pro Podcast. We're recording Thursday, May 16th, a little after 2 p.m. Uh, and there's actually a lot of domestic politics update today. So let's just go straight into it. Uh, big news today, uh, which we actually did not expect this to happen until a few days ago, was that the um, Democratic Party did a primary and chose who will be the candidate for the National Assembly Speaker. And it wasn't whom we expected. Right. We And, and technically, although this is DP primary, they are holding majority seats. So this is probably going to be the Na- National Assembly Speaker uh, starting May 30th. And it's won Sik, not Chumye. Mm-hmm. Uh, which is shocking to me, really, because Chumye, she's a six-term lawmaker, mm. whereas Won Sik is a five-term lawmaker. Right, and I and thought six, seniority mattered. Right, and also six-term, it's it's the... It's the most senior right now in the Democratic Party alongside uh, Cho jong sik I believe. Right, and she came out swinging. Yeah. She was the justice minister who was really going at it with uh, Yoon sung yeol back in the day when he was still the prosecutor general. And she was saying that there's going to be round two, you know, right. put me in there, coach. Uh, but uh, she's not the, going to be the national speaker. And, and also she uh, she is called a general, Chu jang right. General Chu. Mm-hmm. Uh, we know that she is very hostile towards the current administration and the ruling party, which is, I think, why she was elected, really, because she had this image of a really strong... Yeah, Chu sort of, and all, uh, all of her many different Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and also, um, if she had won this primary, she could have become the first ever uh, woman speaker of the National Assembly in South Korea's democratic history. We have had deputy speaker of the, speaker of the National Assembly from the DP side, Kim young uh, Who but, just lost her election not too long ago. Right, um, after moving to PPP, right. but, but, but never the speaker. Uh, but but more important than that, just looking at the causes why this happened, there were a whole lot of round two pro Yi versus not pro Yi Jae-myung sort of infight within the Democrat. They just won the election. What are they doing? Well, that makes sense. They won the election, so now they got to do the infighting. Right. And the the initial controversy was whether or not to have Yi Jae-myung again as a party leader because that looks pretty authoritarian to have him again but i don't but i was one of those people who was convinced that he was going to very easily remain leader i mean he yeah he was going to but symbolically to not go through technical procedures really to have him elected as a party leader again it was a controversy at first and then that sort of spiraled into oh then who gets the speaker of the national assembly job because that is also very high ranking position Mm -hmm. in south korea so who's gonna do that right and then people started wondering if who's going to be the floor leader and then a party leader and the national. So it was all merged together, this issue. All right. And then um, Chumie started using, the, I think it was a very horrible marketing that she did. She started boasting about how the how leader Lee Jae-myung only told her among four candidates, potential candidates, that she is the right fit. Mm-hmm. And then what happened? Um the other candidate, um, Won Sik, uh, he came up on this um, left wing broadcast, or was it a YouTube or something, Kim, Yo- Kim Yo Jun's um, YouTube channel, right? And then claimed that, oh, actually, there's something that Lee Jae Myung also only told me, which is, um, which is a very masculine sentence. It, it means. It, it has being older brother. Right, right, it has multiple connotation that he was probably trying to bring. Like he's older than Yi Jae Myung, and Yi Jae Myung called him intimately Hyung Nim, mm-hmm. um, and said also that he is a right fit. So he was claiming that Yi Jae Myung was saying these nice things not only to Chimia but also to him. Is it possible that Yi Jae Myung was going to all of these people and saying you are actually my favorite? Don't tell anyone else. I mean else. that that is totally possible and I think it's fine because it's okay for leaders to you know just go to potential candidates and say you are fit because of this reason and you are fit for this reason it's mm-hmm. you know you can't really and also you shouldn't take sides mm-hmm. so if he did that great but then what I'm talking about is the optics like in the final week this week they were competing basically for father's love or something <laughs> <laughs> it was really horrible to watch it was just so not democratic 
And then at the end, Chimie lost. So that's what happened. Well, perhaps next time. Yeah. The the glass ceiling remains uh, intact. Right, and then it's something to keep an eye on because there is Chun Bangi and Hu Bangi for a Speaker of the National Assembly. The first for first half and the second half of the of the four year term. Yes. Right, and then for the second term, we we have to keep an eye on who that will that is going to be because technically it's right before the presidential election, so that potentially might need someone who is a bit more feisty mm. than the first half mm -hmm. of the Speaker of National Assembly. So let's just keep an eye on it. But it was a very interesting development. And I could see that there is um, ongoing infight in the Democratic Party, which probably wouldn't stop in, uh, in the foreseeable future. Mm hmm. Topic two, uh, there are a few domestic politics updates, few others, so let's just touch on uh, some of them just very quickly. First Lady is back in the headlines after the elections. Uh, finally, she made her reappearance, mm -hmm. and I believe it was... Or said to make an appearance, but when this is published, the podcast is published, she would have made her appearance. Right, with the summit with the Cambodian uh, leader who's visiting. Right. I forget what... Who, it, oh, it's today. It's today. Um, and... Right. Right, and then she she does have some uh, personal um, history with uh, the, this delegation that's coming to South Korea because last time she visited alongside Yoon, and there was this whole controversy at the Where time as well. she was holding a child. Right. Uh, people said it was poverty porn right, or whatever right, right. it was. But, but then she, at the time, also did get some credit for trying to help some of the vulnerable population there. Um, like medical aids and stuff, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but then that's how she's coming back this time. And at the same time, her name is back in the headlines related to the Dior back scandal. Which is never going away. <laughs> well, um, the just going back a week ago uh, in the press conference that Yoon had after uh, the first time in 21 months, right. he did mention this issue referring to her... Um, unwise as, decisions. Right, unwise decisions and claim that he has been apologizing but it was the first time that he mentioned that word apologize but anyways um he said that he believes the uh, investigation authorities will be strict and firm but so far with the investigations going on they're focusing on the pastor Ex who actually exactly. gave the dior bag to the first lady as opposed to focusing on the first lady herself exactly and also the democratic party already pushed back on the recent reshuffling very interesting timing reshuffling in the prosecution office and other relevant um authorities authorities uh some of them some of whom will be directly handling this case the right. Dior back case mm -hmm. so it's something to keep an eye on it's very easily something that's going to be very easily politicized right who's being appointed who's whose friend who knows who it's going to be a minefield regardless mm. of what who ends up regardless of which position. Right, and lastly on the domestic politics update, Bin Seng Turono is back, the, uh, the what do you call People's Livelihood it? Debate Discussion. Right. People's it's a town hall uh, discussion, yeah, town hall, really. town hall meeting, and there were four regions that Yoon hasn't went to yet. I know that Jeju is one of them. Right, and I think so, one place in the Gyeongsang province, Gyeong, uh, Gyeongsang province as well. Uh, but, but this time, the first one after resumption, what is it about? Well, this was actually a, quite a clever move on his part. And mm. uh, again, I'm saying that the president is being clever two episodes in a row. Uh, this is very highly unusual. <laughs> uh, what happened was that he decided to talk about labor reforms. Mm. Now, the president has talked about how he wants to have... Uh, major reforms during his presidency, mm. labor being one of them. Mm. And after the elections were over, and it just went kaput. Right. With the Democratic Party having the majority, uh, they he just cannot do anything without their, their support. And he made a very interesting uh, proposal. Mm. He said that he wants to f uh, form a governmental organization or a task force that will help to uh, protect workers. Mm. The, and he defined them as ununionized, non-unionized, mm. and vulnerable workers. Huh. Now, this is the sort of a catchphrase and language that the Democratic Party would love to latch on to. I mean, the Democratic Party yeah. is known for the one being uh, there to support the underdogs. Right. And Yoon saying, let's help these guys. And the, 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 the Democratic Party will have a very difficult time saying no. But herein lies a problem. If the government decides to help out the 
non-unionized workers mm. and the vulnerable workers and mm. he mentioned how he wants to help them uh, arbitrate for higher wages and he mentioned a bunch of different proposals but the problem but, but is just not unionized for workers. non-unionized workers and that's the problem the the unions are going to be extremely upset about this mm. if the government really steps up their game and help all these non-unionized workers and what incentive would they have to join the unions right the workers you mean right and so for years the unions have already been losing power uh, uh, and they've been less, uh, despite how may, how often they might appear in the news, being vocal with their protests. Mm. As far as bargaining goes, unions have been losing their power for a number of years already. Right. But with this proposal, they could be defanged significantly. Mm. And uh, why is it that you call it a smart move compared to the past? Well, compared to the past, the president was really uh, going after all unions and all workers with a sledgehammer. Mm. Anytime workers uh, had a strike, whether it was cement truck drivers or mm. wh- whether it was teachers or nurses or doctors, he would he would go on to uh, he would go on the mic and he, and he would say, "We're going to be doing this by the law, mm. and by the law meaning behave or I'll unleash the prosecutors on you." Right. And so now he's actually. Um, Going, taking on an approach that's more like using a scalpel than a sledgehammer. Mm. It's very clever. Yeah. And also, he is create, starting to create this image of actually helping what he calls vulnerable population, but while sort of sidestepping uh, what he had to address when it comes to unionized workers, right? Exactly. All right, next topic, foreign policy and security updates. There was nothing really that major in the past week, but just quickly, is is there any update to the Line Yahoo versus Neighbor case? Uh, Not a whole bunch yet. Now, the government has said that they are going to support South Korean businesses uh, against foreign interference, et cetera, Mm -hmm. et cetera. But uh, what's interesting is that the Democratic Party took a very firm anti-Japanese stance. Mm. The Democratic Party, at least some of the lawmakers, were saying that the 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 Japanese government is able to make these moves be- precisely because of what they call Yoon's subservient foreign policy toward Japan. And not only that, it was also the the fact that they've also been saying that if Yoon fails to make a stronger um, uh, approach toward Japan regarding this issue, then the then th- what they're saying is that the Yoon administration will be accused of being uh, traitors, essentially. Well, this is a very classic angle that the Democratic Party goes for on anything related to Japan. But does this angle really help Naver? I'm not sure if it helps Naver, but it might help the Democratic Party. Mm. Uh, they're at a <laughs> high right now. Right. They won the election in a landslide. And so they're thinking they can do no wrong. Mm. Whatever they're saying has been working. And so they're going to go with this approach consistently. Right. But then to make this into a diplomatic spat like the Democratic Party is going for, um, or fr- to frame it like that, would the, would, like, what's the, what would be the company's perspective? Right now, the company is not saying anything political whatsoever, wisely, and they shouldn't. Mm. They're just saying that whatever decision that they make will be based on their long-term business interests. Mm. So are they going to sell their holdings? Uh, I I don't quite know. They haven't made any announcement yet. But there's been a lot of political noise about this. Mm. And you can bet that Tokyo is paying attention to what's going on. And it has been... Uh, paying extra attention recently I think I don't think Joguk planned this I think it was coincidental that it happened on the same day but Joguk the leader of rebuilding Korea party technically still an alliance party to democratic party he visited Tokdo right and <laughs> the Tokdo the island that Korea uh, has sovereignty over mm. but which Japan claims and they call Takashima and so okay the fact that Chuk, uh, that Chukuk went there, and then there he also mentioned Line Yahoo right. directly, right? Now. Togo, uh, he's a minor party leader. Hmm. But that being said, he still has presidential aspirations and hmm. he could be president someday. And the fact that he went to Tokto as opposed to other minor lawmakers, that has gotten Tokyo's attention as well. Right. So there were um, his his the video of him visiting Tokto got viral on social media because of this one Japanese, um, I think, broadcaster reporter asking him, calling him, I think, Yang Panam, Kadu Kadu Daun Giman, Onion Man. An onion. Uh, the more you peel, <laughs> the more you can find yes right like it wasn't a report but then to Cho the reporter was like why are you visiting Takashima and then Cho responded sorry who are you and then for some reason his supporters really loved his response to the reporter so that got viral it, it's a hint that still Japan related stuff still gets 
viral attention it to a certain extent, right? Fires people up uh, uh, certain segments, and you know it's also politics. Uh, he brought his fans along there, and so whatever he does, he can do no wrong as far as his fans are right, concerned. Right, but but also I thought it's like the angle that he went for in for his remark at Tokto, it was too much because he said that if UN administration doesn't solve these issues, including like Yahoo and Naver, he was implying. It's sunil. Sunil means you are revering Japan. Right. That is too much. <laughs> it's so it's the it's the pendulum swinging the other way. Right. Yoon is deeply unpopular, but he had a rapprochement with Japan, mm. and so they must take the opposite approach. They must be antagonistic toward Japan. Is it uh, short-sighted? Is it myopic? Is it dumb? Yes. But and you know that's politics. Also that must have been a very good material for Cho to use to show that Rebuilding Korea Party can do something even stronger, like say something even stronger than the Democratic Party regarding Japan. Sure, (laughs) if you can call it that. And lastly, Biden and Trump. Uh, This was a big news yesterday for our American listeners. Uh, CNN extended invitation for Biden and Trump to do a broad, I I believe, live broadcast uh, Uh, debate. debate. Live debate in June, I think June 27th. Uh, And more related to South Korea, Biden, um, I I believe, announced a new tariff. What was that about? Sure. Um, Now, as for the debate is concerned, uh, that's not our concern. No, it should Uh, be interesting, though. It will be interesting, but it's not within Korea Pro's purview. Uh, But the tariffs, Mm. that was interesting. Uh, Now, when Biden was running against Trump the first time around, he was saying how tariffs are a bad idea, Mm. how imposing tariffs would just force American consumers to pay more for imported goods. Mm. Uh, but now he's doing exactly what Trump did, hmm. except more. Hmm. Uh, he, what he told USTR was that uh, he wants them to maintain taxes hmm. or in, or increase tariffs. And so, depending on the goods, and they, they include uh, solar uh, solar cells, EV batteries, uh, and a whole bunch of other things. And they're saying raise the ta- raise the tariffs from twenty five to a hundred percent, depending on which product that we're talking about. Why? Uh, and what the Biden administration was saying was that uh, the Chinese government has been subsidizing a lot of these factories, a lot of these uh, manufacturers, and they've been flooding the market with cheap uh, Chinese uh, um, products. Therefore, uh, just making everyone else's um, products unable to compete with their Chinese competitors. Mm. And so what they're saying is that it's unfair advantages that the Chinese government has provided. And so to protect American jobs, they're going to raise these tariffs. Mm. And now if they raise tariffs, now what that does is that it helps to even the playing field. Mm. Now, for those listeners who might not be aware of this, we just had um, a panel discussion with Christian Davis uh, earlier this morning. And Christian was saying that South Korean companies, um, semiconductors or EV batteries or what have you, cannot compete with China when it comes to scale, definitely. Mm. And also because of Chinese advancements technology, South Korea is also losing ground on on that front. Mm -hmm. But as far as, but if South Korea doesn't have to compete with China in a fair and open market, then South Korea can compete. And because of these tariffs that that the that the Biden administration has imposed, we are not in a open and fair market, and this has been beneficial to a lot of uh, South Korean manufacturers. Hmm. I caught your foreign slip just now. You almost said Trump administration. Did I say Trump? <laughs> you said true. <laughs> well, the economic policies are almost identical. Right. So for me, like when I'm watching the debate, something that I will keep an eye on is actually their trade policy. If if that comes up it should be interesting but because there are so many stuff happening right now domestically in the u.s i'm not even sure that's gonna come up but Who knows? If, it, if it does it could be interesting unlock the full career pro experience by joining our community stay informed stay ahead and never miss a beat on korean affairs that matter subscribe today and transform the way you understand korea week ahead. Uh, there were a few announcements from South Korean government this week that w- that are uh, important for the industries here. Something to keep an eye on in the coming weeks if they will actually start implementing that. First one was there was a spike in R&D budget for a certain ministry. Was that the industries ministry? Yeah, yes, it was. It was MATI, the Ministry of Trade, Industry and Energy. Hmm. Uh, 
uh, an economy rather i'm sorry uh, and wh- what they did was that they decided to uh, increase r and d budget uh, by 10 times what it was before mm. this but that doesn't really help matters all that much considering <laughs> how the r and d budget was initially cut by 80% right. uh, but anyway they raised uh, the r and d budget and what they're trying to improve uh, the raise the budget for is hydrogen mm. and hydrogen being a very key component in a lot of sectors that will determine the ev battery industry the semiconductor industry all these industries that are vital for South Korea's economy. And so this is going to be something that we need to keep an eye on. And I read that part of the R&D uh, budget could go into something related to what the military could use in the battlefield or the field training. Sure. Um, what it is exactly is that if it goes according to plan, they mm. plan to build these uh, generators that will they'll run on hydrogen. Mm. And the idea is that these generators will then become very quiet. Mm. Um, this isn't exactly only for the military, but it could have military applications because mm. uh, for any South Korean man who served in the military would know, if they have gone to any of these uh, field exercises they've seen these large gas generated generators must be loud they are loud as sin (laughs) Uh, it is not something that you can ever use if you want to be subtle right Uh, so if once you and the military is not exactly about not being subtle exactly you (laughs) want to try to you know reduce your your presence as much as possible but these generators are just extremely loud and just give you away give you away anywhere Mm. and so with these kinds of hydrogen cells generators mm. then the um, it will have a, it's not as sexy as an F-22 or F-35 mm. but it could Nothing have is. day-to-day pla- uh, practical applications okay uh, we're, we're talking about technology just quickly there was this big p- potentially big news coming out of KAIST a few researchers uh, having this potentially groundbreaking um, invention but then we have been fooled by past yeah um, mm. There was cloning in the past, and there was supposed to be this LKI superconductor, and every one of them just broke right, my heart. just disappointing everybody. But what is this new one? Again, we'll have to wait and see as to what it is. And now, uh, I said this several times before recording, and I'm going to get it wrong again. <laughs> but it is uh, metal ceramic nanofibers. Mm. Uh, I'm pretty sure I still got that wrong, but I I, I believe that's correct. Now, well, what's it used for? Uh, apparently, uh, now. I had to look this up. Mm-hmm. I, was, I said, what are the practical applications? Now, apparently, uh, this will have this uh, Internet of Things sort of application mm. to it. Now, again, Internet of Things is something that just confuses me. Uh, I'm an old timer. <laughs> and so apparently what they're saying is that these kinds of fabrics will be uh, will have access to the Internet. Mm. And so you could wear different kinds of clothes. So you can wear the internet? You can wear the internet. The the clothes will have the kind of fabric and the technology to be able to see exactly what's going on in your body. Mm. Uh, Is your glucose too high? Mm. Uh, Is your cholesterol too low? So it's like wearing Apple Watch. Exactly. Uh, and it's not just that it's also got to do with radiation mm. uh, it can it can help it can help industrial workers wear suits that will help protect them from radiation even more mm. apparently there's going to be a whole lot of industrial uh, applications for this but it's it's an early stage of potentially finding it out right again assuming that this is you know not a bust right so let's keep an eye on it are there any political or foreign relations uh, schedule for next week there's only one that really pops into my mind right now, and that is uh, set for the 21st to the 23rd, and it's the second round of the SMA negotiations. Special measures agreement. Special measures agreement. So thank you. I, I was kind of blanking there for a moment. <laughs> but yes. Uh, defense it's cost sharing. Defense cost sharing between the U.S. and South Korea. Um I'm not sure what they actually did the first time around. I think they just essentially first time around is usually meet and greet and figuring out like what, what each other want. Are. Yeah. So. Uh, I'm not sure how many rounds of agree- uh, negotiations there will be, but mm. uh, this is the second one coming up. And lastly, South Korean Foreign Minister visited Beijing to meet Wang Yi. Um, and this is the first uh, South Korean Foreign Minister visit to Beijing in a few years since Kang kyung Um Is there anything that we are waiting for to see an update or upcoming schedule when it comes to China relations? Uh, this bilateral meeting itself, uh, there was nothing all that special about it. Was it was a symbolic It was visit. symbolic. But what this was a primer for was for the... South Korea, Japan, China Trilateral Summit that's coming up at the Mm. end of this month. Mm. I believe the tentative date is the 26th to the 27th. Mm. And so that's going to be the big thing. But as we just talked about, the tariffs are going to be something that the the Chinese government is going to be very annoyed and concerned about. Mm. And so there is a very big chance that this Trilateral Summit will be hijacked by those uh, tariff discussions.
So let's keep an eye on that. And that's a wrap. Thanks for tuning in. If you want to know more, sign up for our daily executive briefings. We brief you on all you need to know from the past 24 hours and why they matter every morning in your inboxes. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast for your weekly dose of insight. And until next time, I'm Jungmin Kim. And I'm John Lee. Stay connected, stay informed, and we'll see you next time on the Great Pro Podcast.